At NVIDIA's GTC today, the company announced a couple of interesting news items that we'll go over in this video. One of them is NVIDIA's new CPU. It is targeted not at x86 consumer, but it's still very interesting. It starts to look at more of the deep learning space and follows up on what NVIDIA has been doing there. But nonetheless, it is technically an NVIDIA CPU, which makes it inherently interesting because they're known for GPUs. We'll also be talking about NVIDIA's new GPUs, not unsurprisingly. And we'll be going over a couple of the softer solutions that NVIDIA has been working on, including some further detail on its development packages that it shipped previously. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair and their 5000D Airflow. The Corsair 5000D Airflow is an ATX tower with high material build quality and a focus on cooling performance, with attention paid to small details. The case has a unique look with deeply indented cooling pathways on the sides of the front and top panels and has carefully matched colors across the case, available in both white and black. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the first item is that NVIDIA CPU. NVIDIA's CPU announcement was its most prominent or eye-catching out of GTC. GTC is its graphics technology conference that it holds in a couple places around the world every year, but its primary one is in the San Jose area. It wasn't held in person this time, from what we understand anyway. Uh, but they had one anyway. And the NVIDIA CPU is a partnership with ARM. You may remember that NVIDIA is currently attempting to purchase ARM, but the NVIDIA ARM acquisition hasn't cleared regulatory hurdles yet, so it's not official. There's an offer that's on the table. It's, from what we understand, been accepted by both parties, but it's a matter of the governments in various regions, the US and the UK especially, uh, approving the deal, and I suppose the, the EU. So that's not gone through yet, which means that technically, NVIDIA is working with ARM, not NVIDIA is making the CPU in its entirety because it doesn't outright own, own ARM right now. NVIDIA claims that its new Grace CPU required, quote, 10,000 engineering years of work. We're assuming that NVIDIA agrees with our commenter who thinks that we should use only obscure metrics for all measurements uh, because either that's 10,000 engineers working for one year or NVIDIA is low-key calling its engineers slow. Regardless, the new Grace CPU isn't meant for consumer x86 style processing. Uh, NVIDIA is further entrenching itself in deep learning and the market for machine learning with the Grace CPU, stating that the Grace CPU specializes in, quote, natural language processing, recommender systems, and AI supercomputing. NVIDIA's previously demonstrated Jarvis is an example of its language systems, while recommender systems are similar to what you might have inadvertently used while arriving on this very video. As for hard specs, there aren't a lot of them, but we've got some numbers. NVIDIA's Grace CPU is an ARM collaboration that natively supports NVLink Gen 4, not to be confused with GeForce NVLink, and it enables a 900 gigabyte per second CPU to GPU interconnect. NVIDIA claims that this is, quote, 30 times higher aggregate bandwidth than today's leading servers. As for where that number comes from, we tried to figure it out, and it looks like it's a simple calculation of 900 gigabytes divided by roughly 30 gigabytes per second, so 900 per second by 30 per second gets you to the capability of PCIe Gen 4 by 16. So that would be the 30x number that they're probably referencing. That level of simple math doesn't always cleanly apply to non-theoretical workloads like this one, as other limitations often present themselves first or along the way. But we also don't work in servers, so we can't really speak to the use cases that would leverage this interconnect, and probably they exist. That's all for CPU to GPU comms, though. There's also CPU to CPU. It is a server CPU, after all. You could feasibly have multiple of them in a single server. And the, uh, in the event of multiple gray CPUs in a single server, it's marketed as being a 600 gigabyte per second NVLink Gen 4 interconnect for those. Memory bandwidth was stated as 500 gigabytes per second for LP DDR5X, and that's ECC memory. And then NVIDIA said that HBM GPU memory is being used for the GPUs uh, in, t in theory to simplify programmability, from what NVIDIA is saying. Now, NVIDIA didn't reveal a core count for the gray CPU. It uh, did say that the CPU architecture is ARM's Neoverse, and it has a TBD, manufacturing process node, so we don't know details on that yet. The release target for it is 2023. NVIDIA stated that Swiss National Supercomputing Center and the US Department of Energy's Los Alamos National Laboratory will be the first two deploying GRACE, or at least among the first two, deploying GRACE-equipped supercomputers for scientific research. NVIDIA's primary goal with this appears to be going in the direction of enabling higher capacities 
of usable memory by the GPU specifically, and communicating via a fast link to the CPU will enable that. NVIDIA's competitors in this space would be the expected two. That would be AMD and Intel, traditionally. So the next section is on NVIDIA's new A-series GPUs. This is, to an extent, killing or rebranding the Quadro series. At least the name Quadro didn't really appear in the announcements for some of these A-series GPUs. NVIDIA announced either six or eight new GPUs, depending on how you count them. NVIDIA says eight with its method of counting. There's the RTX A4000 and the A5000. Both of these are desktop GPUs. There's an A10 and an A16, which are data center GPUs, and then also some mobile GPUs. And those would include uh, four Max-Q laptop SKUs. There's A4000 and 5000 once again, and then there are A2000 and A3000 with some specification changes between mobile and desktop. So NVIDIA is moving away from the Quadro name, it looks like. Uh, this is typically how some of these cards would have been classified, the non-data center ones, that is, in NVIDIA's lineup, but it's gone for this one. The desktop A4000 and A5000 cards are the most immediately relevant to us and our audience. These are designed for discrete workstations and we actually use a couple of RTX 5000s, not the A series, but in our one of our production machines we use those. They're actually not as useful to us as gaming class cards are for our specific workloads, but that's just the nature of how they're built. So historically, Quadro, or now A series drivers, are useful for certain certifications and signatures that companies want to have uh, for any type of, well, for liability, really, is why it's there. NVIDIA says the A4 and 5000 GPUs are for, quote, speeding up AI, graphics, and real-time rendering. These models didn't come completely out of the blue because the A40 data center GPU and top-tier A6000 desktop GPU were announced in October of last year, and NVIDIA's, quote, world's largest GPU announcement for the A100 came earlier than that back in May, which we covered back when it was announced. The A4000 has 16 gigabytes of GDDR6, it supports ECC, and it's listed as a 140-watt part with a single-slot blower cooler, making it one of the smaller cards that NVIDIA currently makes. The A5000 has 24 gigabytes of GDDR6, it also supports ECC, and it's listed as 230 watts with a dual-slot blower cooler. Unlike the A4000, it lists support for NVIDIA's virtual GPU software, and both cards are PCIe Gen 4x16 and have four DisplayPort 1.4 ports. This is where NVIDIA gets a little bit more confusing. So out of all the cards announced today, only the A5000 is NVLink compatible. As a reminder, there's a few different versions of NVLink. So there's an NVLink that we talked about for things like the Grace CPU, and then there's NVLink for these devices, and then there's NVLink for consumer GPUs. And actually, there are technically only four slot spacing uh, NVLink bridges for consumer GPUs. So if you want RTX 3090s in NVLink, you have no options except for the one that NVIDIA has provided. Even if you buy EVGA or someone who's rebranded it, it's still the same slot spacing, which reduces you to a couple of motherboards on the market, mostly X299 and sometimes Threadripper. Uh, so not very useful to the extreme overclocking crowd. That said, the Quadro or the A series has a different set of NVLink bridges, and those are available in other slot spacings. So the A5000 is NVLink capable. It allows two cards to be connected for a combined pool of 48 gigabytes of memory. NVIDIA has historically made the difference between Quadro and GeForce SLI NVLink bridge uh, options confusing already, and currently they're selling different bridge SKUs for the 3090, again, four slots for max inconvenience, and the A5000 and A6000, which have two and three slot versions available. Puget Systems has experimented with its own multi-thousand dollar GPUs of combining various bridges and cards, and has reported that the RTX and A-series bridges appear to be cross-compatible and function identically. The fact that a partner of NVIDIA had to go and test at its own risk is a little bit absurd, but not abnormal for NVIDIA and its partners. The A-series bridges are more expensive, in theory, and they're also difficult to find at all. As for the Max-Q stuff, Max-Q is a blanket brand for optimizations to make NVIDIA GPUs work in laptops without starting a bonfire or a jet engine. The Max-Q laptop versions of the A4000 and A5000 are lower spec than their desktop counterparts. As of this writing, data sheets are easily accessible for the mobile parts, 
but not necessarily the desktop ones, although the specs have been distributed to some media. According to reporting by Serve the Home, the discrete A4000 has 6144 CUDA processing cores, 192 Tensor cores, and 48 RT cores. NVIDIA's materials show that the mobile version has 5120 processing cores, 160 Tensor, and 40 RT cores. The mobile A4000 has 8 gigabytes of GDDR6, and the A5000 has 16 gigabytes. We won't read through the entire list of part numbers here, but more detailed specs will be available on NVIDIA's site later. Or, again, you can check some of them on Serve the Home or Tech Gauge. A large part of the draw of Quadro type cards is reliability and software support, rather than just raw performance with the GeForce cards. And NVIDIA advertises that the laptop GPUs are, quote, backed by the NVIDIA Studio ecosystem. Now, the A10 and the A16 are the other new GPUs. These don't have active cooling. They do have heat sinks, but they're intended to be used in servers. Uh, so 1U, 2U boxes, stuff like that. And uh, they also don't have any video out, which is, again, normal for this type of card. They're functionally accelerator cards. You plug them in, you use something else for your display out if you have any at all. The A10 is a 150 watt card with 24 gigabytes of memory. And the marketing here focuses mostly on, quote, virtual desktop infrastructure with NVIDIA Omniverse, which is, it, it's been detailed a couple of times now, but we don't work with it. So we sometimes have a little bit of trouble visualizing what exactly Omniverse is trying to be. It appears that it's functionally a, uh, basically a, a collaborative development or visualization engine. It's usable for things like games or also usable for architectural firms, uh, design firms like BMW has a, a separate design division that uses Omniverse. Uh, so multiple users collaborating on a single platform. Basically, it's how it's being marketed. Omniverse is even more of the focus point for the less conventional A16, which actually runs four GPUs with 16 gigabytes of memory apiece on a single card. So it's sort of interesting technologically. We've seen multi-GPU cards for a long time now and, and in the past. Not new as a concept, but it's always fun to, to cover because it's not really that common anymore outside of this type of application. Now, discrete GPUs for desktop and data center will be available in April. The laptop GPUs are targeting a more vaguely defined, quote, uh, Q2 this year from global OEMs, and that's what we have for that stuff. Now, the last story here would just be the NVIDIA RTX games reel. So there wasn't a lot in here that was actually useful to anyone, but some of the games they showed were interesting, and this is really as far as NVIDIA goes with GTC for games, because GTC is focused on professional users. That would be people traditionally in the Quadro line when it was the pushing point, and then also for data center users. So RTX mostly gets mentioned because of investors and investor interest, and then also because of the professional developer interest, but not as a gaming product. There have been announcements at GTC for gaming cards. It's been a little while. So for the games that were shown, uh, Omniverse, first of all, was shown just, again, collaborative software. Everybody's been talking about this for a little while and showing it in architectural and design firms and for some game development. Uh, they also showed Bright Memory, which is an interesting game because it's an Unreal Engine developed game. It uses almost entirely or maybe entirely Unreal Engine marketplace assets. And from what we could see, it looks like the development studio is still just one person, which is more of an advertisement for Unreal Engine and its options than it is for what NVIDIA is doing, but still pretty interesting. Uh, NVIDIA was interested in promoting this because of the RTX inclusion from what it looks like, DXR. There was also a reel for Naraka Blade Point, which I'm not personally familiar with. Boundary was shown. It seems to be a six-axis shooter, similar to the one that FutureMark made many years ago. Uh, a colossal failure from FutureMark, but really interesting game nonetheless. Boundary perhaps will do a bit better now that it's had more time to advance as a concept. Cyberpunk seemed like it was an accident. It slipped in there. It was for one split second you saw cyberpunk and that was probably more of a let's satisfy the contractual agreement to promote their game in exchange for them putting our name in their game's loading screens but not get too attached to it because there's not a great perception right now of that particular title so it was almost it looked like nvidia only had that in there because they had to have it in there it was so shortly shown and then there was also a game that I'm kind of interested in. We may benchmark it because the graphics look look pretty good, and it seems like it might be fun. But uh, game is called 
Black Myth Wukong, which you may already be aware of because it was shown a little while ago, but uh, they showed a good amount of footage from that. So that was all there was on the gaming front of things, and it was probably just thrown out there as a get some coverage in gaming media like this, and maybe investors and developer interest, but not their focus for this show. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.cameraxis.net if you'd like to pick up one of our new mod mats. The new mod mat Volt is actually we're through more than half the inventory at this point, maybe around half. So if you want one, you'll need to buy it soon. We're going to be restocking, of course, but I uh, didn't think we'd, we sold a lot of them very quickly. And that, that was the biggest order we've ever done by a lot. So you can grab one on the store if you want it. Plenty of the original large and original medium available as well. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for additional videos. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always, and we'll see you all next time.